sow the seed. And her name should be written in capitals in the church history of Pennsylvania instead of being only casually mentioned. On board the ship from New York to Dover, Anna writes back to Bethlehem, quote, and this is um, and my translation. Actually, no, this is written in English. As I never shall forget Pennsylvania in general, so I think I shall remember thee also, an ever dear church of sinners. It is very weighty to me that even from out of the English nation, which hath erred for so many years, <laughs> trying many and various ways, the Lord should gather a little flock and bring it to rest on his holy wounds. End of quote. She's writing not as someone who said, oh, that was a great trip. She's writing as someone who's thinking about the history of the church. She's thinking about the, the salvific importance of her activities in Pennsylvania. And I think nobody has talked about Anna in those terms really at all. Life on board was rough. But in a separate letter to Brother Anton Zeiper, dated March 1743, Anna describes this journey back to Europe. They set sail on January 20th from New York, and within six days, they formed a sea congregation on the ship. They chose elders. Everyone was seasick except <laughs> Brother Andrew and his wife. After experiencing two great storms that washed them onto a sandbank, where wicked sailors tried to take advantage of them, they finally arrived February 17th in Dover, and then continued on to London on February 19th. So these are some of the people that she's meeting um, in London. In London, Anna stayed with Brother Hutton. However, not for long. Brother Spangenberg was not in London at that point when they when Sinsendorf and his entourage got to London, but rather he was in Yorkshire um, at, at what would become Fulneck. And so Sinsendorf, Benigna, and Anna Nichman travel on to Yorkshire by coach. And in Yorkshire, Anna continues her work among the single sisters as Sinsendorf preachers to assemble crowds on their congregation day. Yorkshire, I don't know how many of you know Yorkshire, it's very rural. Um, at that time, there was the beginning of the cloth trade there. Um, Anna describes the people in the congregation at one of the Gemeintage as hungry bees. That's an exact quote. Wonderful. Sometimes there are between 1,000 and 3,000 people there listening to Sinsendorf preach and Anna is also speaking to the single sisters there as well. What do they talk about? They talk about their experiences here in Pennsylvania. And especially they tell stories of the American Indians, which are very, very popular. <coughs> this is Fulneck, um, which was, um, was, I think, Lambs Hill. It's called Lambs Hill at that time. Um, and there'll be more, um, I'll tell you a little more about Fulneck in a second. Um, are you okay? Are you staying away? Yeah. Yes, all right. I'm telling you thrilling stories of Anna on horseback um, and Native Americans. Well, now she's in Yorkshire. All right, so um, once back in London, um, yeah, okay. well, uh, next slide. Once back in London, Anna meets with and preaches in English to 30 young women in the Fetter Lane Chapel in London. Those women in the audience are captivated by her words, and if not already members of the very influential Fetter Lane Society, they quickly join. Several of the women in my book, in the Moravian Women's Memoirs book, hear Anna Nichol and Sinsendorf preach at the Fetter Lane Chapel and join the Moravians there and come here to Bethlehem after that. Anna writes at this time, quote, On Sunday I held a quarter of an hour with 30 young women together with three bands. I with ten laborers and two others with each ten sisters. I can make use of my little English here very well. But, she assures her listeners, don't you know, my dear brother, that the Bethlehem brethren and sisters are remarkable above all others. So these are the stories she's telling. She's talking about Bethlehem. She's talking about this place. She's talking about her experiences in the mission um, to the native people. And this is what is captivating people. You probably know the Fetter Lane Chapel was destroyed in the 1940 Blitz. Um, this is the chapel here, the outside of it. Um, and then there's a nice little engraving of the inside. There's nothing there now. <coughs> All this success had its results. Um, after returning from America, Sinsendorf made Anna into the Gemeinmutter of all women in the Moravian Church, and by so doing, ousted his wife, Elfmutter, from this position. <laughs> uh, yes. 
<laughs> After stops in Helmhart, Helmholt and Ebersdorf, Anna continued on to Silesia and Riga with Zinzendorf, where she ended up being in prison for 19 days in 1743 to 1744. For the next 10 years, Anna continued her work with Zinzendorf in consolidating the Moravian congregations and helping him to weather the crisis of the so-called sifting time. In 1749, she returned to London with Zinzendorf, and in June, they return again to the congregation in Yorkshire. What I find so fascinating in reading these accounts of Anna's activities among the ordinary people of the Yorkshire countryside is how seamlessly this woman is able to slip into vernacular societies and languages. The Full Neck Diary of the Tabernacles reports that on July 5th, 1749, the ordinary and the mother sang a good deal of the liturgies, hymns, and other verses in English to the congregation. What's interesting, um, if we go to the next slide, I think. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting is that here she is in Yorkshire. They remember her return visit um, on the way back from America in 1742. And they want to celebrate that anniversary. And so in the diary, um, they have, they describe in great detail this wonderful celebration of Sinsendorf and Anna, or Anna and David Mitchell setting out for America. I would love to know if this painting still exists. Um, it is a, <coughs> there is a painting that it's a height painting in the other diary. It, um, it describes this as being by height. Um, the mother is standing, so Anna Nitchman is standing with her pilgrim staff in her hand and her clothes gathered up, ready for going to go to America. And then you can read the rest of this. So um, then uh, there's the Lausanne for the day. In the middle of the hall, a picture of Papa from Sinsendorf's birthday was illuminated on the left-hand side, the picture completed by the single sisters. The whole room was covered with green and red cloth, and in the middle between the windows was a pretty throne behind which sat our dear and beloved heart, Anna Nishman, with well, next to the middle of the illumination stood two prettily decorated tables filled on top with confectionery and wine, which had been arranged by the brothers and sisters. In front of the tables, a large L was to be seen, and in front of the other, AC, the Anna Capitas which presented a very pretty picture. Papa, the mother, and the other hearts were all very pleased, and everyone was very pleased. So everyone was very happy. Mm -hmm. um, in the other uh, diary, the Diary of the Tabernacles, which describes this too, it's interesting to compare two different descriptions of the same event. They make it quite clear that the local people who are cloth manufacturers are the ones who have made the cloth, which is described here, and you put it into this celebration. <coughs> before Anna and Sinsendorf. Remarkable. Um, okay, so while in Yorkshire, Anna and Anna Nitchman and Anna Johanna Peach conduct speakings with the single sisters, while Sinsendorf and Christian Lanatus conduct speakings among the single brothers. And interestingly, on the communion day, Papa and Mother, so this is Sinsendorf and Anna, shared in the Lord's Supper with us, which was very important. After so, Anna dis dis the distribution of the contra of the uh, communion. Sinsendorf consecrates the wine, very clearly described in the diary. So that's as far as I got with the couple of archives I visited. In 1756, Elmer von Sinsendorf died, and just a year later, on June 27, 1757, Sinsendorf married Anna Nitschmann, and thereby transformed her from Gemeinmutter to Jüngerin. Although subsequent church historians have considered the marriage to be an aunt's ear, a marriage that was purely businesslike, um, permitted Sinsendorf to work closely with his adopted sister, Anna, it was also commonly assumed to be a love match. The potentially scandalous marriage that crossed strict class lines was kept secret from all but an inner circle in the church. Anna and Sinsendorf were married by Leonhard Dorber, remember, he was supposed to marry her, <laughs> in private in the Berdenstorff Castle, but it was only publicly announced a year later in November 1758. Although Sinsendorf apparently wanted a son to replace the Stephanatus, the marriage between him and Anna produced no children. She was in her 40s, after all, when she married him. She continued her heavy travel, heavy travel schedule, throughout the German states with him, 
but both of their health was deteriorating. After spending his final weeks in the Herrschaft's house in Helmut, on May 9, 1716, Silzendorf passed away, separated from Anna, who was also sick, but was in the single sister's house. I find that interesting. Mm -hmm. It is recorded that as his coffin passed her window, Anna was able to stand and watch it as it made its way up the street to the goddess. Twelve days later, on May 21st, 1760, Anna died and joined him on the Buddhag. She was buried next to him, and this is the family graves here. On the other side was his first wife, Abuta. What's interesting is on her grave, it actually says Anna Nitschmann and not Anna von Sinsendorf, which said a lot. So I'll, I'll conclude now. So Anna Nitschmann's legacy to the history of pietism lies in her significant contribution to several branches of the Moravian Church primarily mission work, hymnody, and religious leadership. I haven't even talked about it yet. Anna's efficacy in the mission field was enormous. Although severely under-researched, archival evidence reveals, just a little bit I've shared with you tonight, that Anna was a superb missionary and a superb leader. Her interactions with American Indians in Pennsylvania were effective and long-lasting, and her work establishing the girls' school in Philadelphia with Anna Margrethe Bechner was foundational, not least, to Moravian College. Furthermore, Anna Nitschmann was also an accomplished hymn writer, especially productive between the years of 1735 and 1748, composing while in Germany, England, and here in North America. Um, for example, the 1741 Helmut of Gesangbuch contains 56 hymns of her composition. Um, despite later efforts to de-emphasize her importance during her lifetime, Anna Nitschmann was an object of widespread reverence. Archival records, that I've, some of which I've shared with you tonight, reveal lavish celebrations of her birthday throughout the Moravian world, from North America to Germany. And her death was as much a shock to the Moravian church as was Sinsendorf's. However, it is important to consider what is missing from Anna Nitschmann's archival records. Falling prey to the masking of female piety in post-1760 Bethlehem, and beyond, the vast majority of her personal papers, diaries, and letters were deliberately destroyed after her death. And you can ask Paul about that. Um, Paul, <coughs> excuse me. Beverly maybe points to the additional subtle ways in which Anna's foundational uh, activities were de emphasized in 1761. <coughs> the recent discovery of a set of and Nishman's addresses to the Single Sisters choirs can give today's reader some insight into her efficacy as a preacher. And as mentioned above, both textual and visual evidence shows that Anna Nishman preached in America to men and women, to Quakers, Moravians, and other sects. Although Peter Falk argues that Anna preached only to other women in the Single Sisters choir and did not preach to men, other scholars argue the opposite. To date, Biographers have directly relied very heavily on her own memoir, as I talked about. But, however, um, the deliberate destruction of Anna's personal papers, letters, diaries after her death has unfortunately relegated her to relative obscurity within the history of Pietism. So, my mission, my mission, is to re, is to rewrite that is to look at her efficacy as a leader of pietist women, as a preacher, <coughs> as a hymn writer, and as a missionary. Um, and that's what I intend to do. So come back in May and see if I've done what I said I was going to do. If you want to. Next slide, last slide. Yeah. So that, and my voice is about to give out, so that's it.